are you feeling? You got John Riggs here today, ranking games from High Tech Expressions. They made a... F Hold on. A few game show games, several children's games, and even a platformer or two that's actually really decent. You gotta make sure you're subscribed. I'm doing more giveaways for subscribers when we hit the next goal. And you are not allowed to skip ahead the video. We have to watch all the games so you can let me know which one was your favorite in the comments. Starting this list, oh, do we gotta talk about this? Yeah, they made a Barbie game for the NES. I honestly think they were targeting a girl's audience making this game when it's not very good. The sound effects are gross, the jumping mechanic is off. It's kind of weird where you throw, I'm guessing, these diamonds or something, and then you have to make them land on things to get them to do something for you. I think the problem I have the most with Barbie for the NES is the fact that I still play it every once in a while, and that's a, my own problem. It's a very bad game, but it's not super terrible. And I will give it props for having pretty cool graphics for the hair and a super large sprite. So, eh, you know what? It's not an F. I'll give this game a D. This is the Chess Master. It's chess. It's full price chess. It is the free chess you get when there's a thing or an app or you got your computer back in the day that came with chess. Now, I know how to play this game. I'm not very good at it. In fact, I'm intentionally losing. Sure, why not? One thing you can do is back up your moves. It's like, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Then you can go back up, back up, back up, back up, back up. You can keep going back and back and back until you get to a spot where you think you can you know, you have a better strategy. Queen's Gambit is not. It is the chess master. And it's chess. It's a C. It's chess. Funhouse. An awesome game show back in the day, specifically for kids that were like my age. Perfect. You even have 8-bit J.D. Roth. And J.D. Roth, if you don't remember, was, I mean, he was everywhere. Although the game show was insane and super awesome and fun, the NES game, not so much. It's basically you're uh, around on these playing fields and you have to flip over these things or hit these targets until you find the key, which will make you go to the next level. Not super exciting. Funhouse the game show? Look it up sometime. It was super cool. The video game? Uh, not a lot. I'm giving this game a D. How about The Hunt for Red October? That was like the hot movie of its time. How about one of the slowest moving vertical shooters you could ever imagine with a super hard difficulty because you don't have a whole lot of hit points. You move too slowly. There's bolts coming at you from above, from below. There's mines and stuff. Yeah, how about that? How does that get you? How, how fun does that sound on a system, on a platform that has all these great shooters? We get to The Hunt for Red October. No, yeah, no, not so much. Well, I, I don't blame you. I'm giving this one a D. Mickey in Numberland. Now I'm going to rank these based on when my children played these when they were much younger. And my kids did play these. And what's nice about these children's games is you don't die. You just carry on and continue on as much as you need. So in this one, you just have to find everything that is that number that you're looking for in these worlds that you're in. And then every once in a while there might be a little mini game as well that you can, you know, can, can you guess the, the, the what numbers fall next in this sequence? Well, maybe. You just move from stage to stage and follow the task it tells you to do. Nice and simple, easy going. Let's give it a C. We took care of Numberland, but now we have Mickey's Safari in Letterland. Can you believe it? Well, we have Safari Mickey now. And again, you can't die in this game. You can just carry on and continue. And you find these gems that have the alphabet in them, apparently, but they will spell a name eventually at the bottom of the screen. And maybe you can predict what the name is going to be, or maybe you can predict what the word will come up with at the end. Did you guess Hen? If so, you're awesome. That's really it. You just have fun in these stages trying to find these letters. When you find the letters, it'll spell a word. You can move on from there. Yeah, I like the other one. I'll give this one a C as well. I remember my kids liking this one. Jim Henson's Muppet Adventure, Chaos at the Carnival. Anytime you have Muppet and Chaos in the same sentence, that's good news for me. Unfortunately, this game is one of the worst games on the NES. I'm not, man, do you have a Muppets game finally? Finally, a Muppets game. Muppets appeal to all audiences. Yeah, they're cute, they're fun, they're cool, like for kids and everything. Uh, Grown-ups love them as well. It's the Muppets, and you can't go wrong. Well, this game you can. Four amazing stages. When I say amazing, I mean amazingly terrible. You got Rafting Kermit for some reason. 
you have the car course, who I believe is animal on a bumper car, basically. And you're just uh, traveling through, and you don't know if you're just, you just keep going. <laughs> That's all you do, you just keep going. Collecting the flags, avoiding the bombs. Don't get the oil slick. You got Gonzo in space. Why couldn't it have been Miss Piggy in space? That would have made more sense. Well, here's Gonzo in space, flying around, and you can shoot these things out of the way. And then finally, oh, fortunately finally, uh, Fozzie in this maze where you have to like collect your bow ties uh, to carry on to the next stage. If this game wasn't the Muppets, it may have ranked higher, but you throw the Muppets into this and you make a bad game out of it? Oh, come on, that just hurts my feelings. This game's an F. How about Orb 3D? They really uh, tackled the 3D-ness of this game. It's kind of like Pong, but a lot more confusing, because you have to hit your button to pop these balloons, and when you do that, then your orb kind of like, you know, goes in a different angle, goes in a different direction, and you just have to keep orbiting these things and hitting these, uh, these bubbles uh, for them to disappear and move on to the next stage. You have fuel in this game, because apparently your orb uh, is gas-powered, but you can go to this gas station and, uh, you know, pop in one of these things to get some fuel back if you'd like. It always looked cool. I mean, I'll give it that. I, th I thought this game looked... I thought it looked pretty cool as a game uh, published by High Tech Expressions. However, man, it's just, you, you play it once, you're like, okay, I'm good for the rest of my life. Never need to see this game ever again. <laughs> Let me give it a little, you know what, the graphics alone or, or the, you know, whatever the animation is and stuff, I'll at least give it a C. How about that? Remote Control could be one of the greatest game shows of all time. It was a game show that appealed to that young adult audience. I loved watching this on MTV. You have channels to choose from, and the channels are the different questions. The problem is you don't know what the categories are until you click that channel, and you get two per stage. So you click a random channel, and you find out, oh, this one's going to be about Batman. Okay, so you need to get a Batman question. Did you get it right? You know the second question will also be a Batman question. Pretty neat. Did you get that run right? As usual, most points wins at the end of the game. It's kind of just kind of a fun thing to do here. I love me some remote control. I don't mind popping into this. So then, seriously, wow. When I'm playing this game, you're gonna you're gonna do that to me, really? The issue with playing this game today is it's based on questions that they could have asked in the late '80s, written by someone from the '70s. So a lot of the questions. Uh, deal with TV shows and stuff from like the 70s and 80s that you may not have an answer to, you know? Well, I was gonna give you an S, but I can't now. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, this, this game's super fun, and um, I, I come back to it every once in a while. I'll give this game a B. There was a week and a half in the very early to mid 90s where people were rollerblading. Rollerblading was the it thing for a second. So to capitalize on this, they whipped together this game in a big hurry. It plays like Paperboy minus throwing the newspapers, twice as hard to land anything, with extra obstacles, and more dumbness. It's the game you would have gifted someone if they were a rollerblader. And it's, no, like Roller Games from Konami, that's a pretty good game. But it plays more like a beat-em-up, you happen to be rollerblading. This game, you're just rollerblading down this busy, broken street. This street, believe it or not, is based on your town. That's <laughs> the, the, the broken roads and stuff like that. No, come on, skip this game, it's an F. If you're looking for those Sesame Street games for the NES, look no further than what was published by High Tech Expressions, Produced by Rare. That's right, if you're wondering like, hey, how come the music, how come some of the animations and glitter and glamour and stuff from the Sesame Street games are actually pretty decent? Well, I mean, Rare had something to do with a couple of them anyway. Got Sesame Street 1, 2, 3, we'll start with this one. There is a uh, match the object with uh, Ernie the Magician, apparently. I remember my kids played this one a lot. This one specifically, like this, this one with Ernie to match the shapes and everything like that. I remember hearing this in the background when I was like, you know, cooking dinner or doing the dishes. Two years old and four years old giggling playing this game. I, that, that's fond memories for me. And they also had an Astro Grover. That taught you about numbers and maybe even a little bit of math too if you're advanced at that level at an early age. And Astro Grover was okay, but my kids really played that, uh, the Ernie's magical, whatever they call it, Ernie's, Ernie's magic shapes. There you go. And that's what you could find on Sesame Street 1, 2, 3. 
it's great. I mean, as far as like the kids' games go, um, it's it's one of the better ones. Just because by nature of my kids were the you know pick of this game, so I, I got I'll at least give it a C. They also made a Sesame Street ABC. And this is another one that my kids played quite a bit too. And it gave you a few options going into it as well. That you could just either match the letter or whatever the case is, but oftentimes they would do the try to spell the word. And oftentimes they would only give you the letters of one word you could spell. Um, sometimes there might be more than one, but they'd really help you out here on this game. You stop the carousel when it drops. It goes in there. Can you ring the bell? Get a little dance sequence. Yeah, nothing says 8-bit NES like Cookie Monster and Bert getting crunk. Ernie's Big Splash. Well, that was a kind of a fun one, too. That was, you just have to make the maze to get your rubber ducky to Ernie. And then you get the big, you know, animation out of it. And it's more fun to watch. It's just more fun to watch. You can fill up the whole screen if you want to just go straight there. This one's not so bad, too. I'm also getting this one a C. And then on top of that, they did make a compilation cart that was both, you know, the Sesame Street ABCs and 123s on the same cartridge. So uh, all three of them get a C. Next up we have High Tech Expressions, Big Birds Hide and Speak. This game touted amazing speech quality and I gotta give it to them. It sounds really good for an NES game. Fine, Grover. The prompts are instead of reading it, he tells you what's up. He tells you what to do. So that's kind of cool. Whether it be to find one of the cast members from Sesame Street or to spell a word or something like that. Um, it's it's Big Bird's hide and speak. And it, the, the gimmick was you could hear Big Bird speak in the game. And it is, it's Big Bird's voice. It's not like some dude down the hall. It's the voice of Big Bird being Big Bird's voice. That's pretty cool. Give this game a C as well. E. N. But out of all the Sesame Street games, my kids played this one the most. Sesame Street Countdown, Jerry Nelson as the Count, and he is the original voice and I believe the puppeteer of the Count. So when you hear the voice, that is the Count's voice, can't mistake it. Got it. Like Mickey in Numberland, it's a lot it's very similar. It's you 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 get a number, you find your number, whatever the number happens to be, and then in the stage, you have to find more of that number to complete the stage. And again, you don't die in this game or anything like that. You just go through and you find the numbers. And it's simple to control. Whether you want to run back and forth or just jump into everything, that, that works too. This is my list. I'm making up the rules. My kids loved this game. They played it so much. And it was, it was heartwarming to hear it. Um, I'm giving this game a B. Got it! Ah, ah, ah. They made a Tom and Jerry game for the NES. And if you haven't played it yet, it's actually really decent. It's, a, it's actually not bad at all. Nice fun platformer, big levels. You play as, is it Jerry? I believe Jerry's the mouse, right? It's been a long time. Now, if you're not familiar, Tom and Jerry is probably the most violent cartoon of all time. There were no words, just on-site beef. As soon as they saw each other, they would try to murder each other. And that's kind of <laughs> what this game's all. It's usually Tom towards Jerry, then Jerry usually gets the upper hand, as per usual. Uh, but some, I mean, like Itchy and Scratchy from The Simpsons and all that, I know The Simpsons is getting kind of older too, uh, but I mean, that was, I'm, Tom and Jerry had to have been inspired by that because, oh man, this game's insane. Oh, and well, the cartoon was insane um, and hilarious. Uh, but this, uh, the game itself, the NES game, is actually a really decent platformer. It's not bad. Now, I wouldn't put it up there with the likes of like a Mega Man or a Mario 3 or even a Tiny Toon Adventures, but seriously, if you haven't played it yet, it's actually pretty decent. I love to rank games among themselves for the specific companies, and if I'm doing that, this game gets an A. Win, Lose, or Draw. I really like this title screen. Win, Lose, or Draw was a game show that you could see on television. It was Pictionary or whatever that thing is. It's like you get the word, you get the clue, you have to write it, you know, you have to draw the picture and get the rest of your teammates to guess it. And that's kind of what that game is all about. And that gives you the same idea at home uh, when you play this game. Now, if you're playing two player, you can, if you'd like, you can uh, have the computer draw for you and then you guess. That, that, that's basically you know what most did I believe you can also just play a one player you can also just play a single player mode if you just want to go through and not worry about the computer playing along the fun of it though really if you have two players is for you to draw for the other player because drawing with an NES pad <laughs> when all you have is eight directions it's, you come up with some pretty interesting drawings uh, to say the very least here's a self-portrait 
And can you guess what I'm drawing here? I'll speed up the footage a little bit, but if you can guess, let me know in the comments before it finishes. Win, lose, or draw, I, I don't know. I had fun with it, but it, the, the fun wears quickly. This game's also a C. Let me know in the comments which one was your favorite. Do it now. More subscriber giveaways are coming soon when I hit my next goal, so make sure you're subscribed.